Martin, thank you so much for agreeing to meet with me today and for welcoming me into your lovely home. It's a, a real privilege to meet you. Yeah. And it, you're in an area that I know so little about, so I'm, I feel like I'm sitting very mm. humbly at your feet. Mm. Well, don't be too humble. It's great <laughs> that you're here. Thank you very much for coming. Well, thank you. Mm. What, what got you interested? How did you get started in this area? Well, it wasn't a particular childhood aspiration. I was interested in numbers and nature mm. as a child and I turned out to be good at mathematics and so uh, when I went to university um, I specialised in mathematics and I realised I was a mistake because I wasn't a person with a mindset of the other students who were really going to be mathematicians. Uh, I like to think in a more sort of synoptic or synthetic way mm. and I was lucky that uh, I had the chance to get into the subject of astronomy and cosmology at a time uh, when it was really starting to develop very rapidly. Um, and uh, I was lucky to be in a good university and to be there at a time when uh, lots of things were new. And that means the experience of the old guys is at a heavy discount and young people can quickly make a mark. <laughs> and so I was lucky in that respect yeah. because I'm talking about the mid-1960s. That's a time when there was the first strong evidence that the universe started with a big bang and the first evidence that black holes might exist and many other discoveries. Mm. Uh, but the pleasure in my career has stemmed from the fact that the pace of discovery has not slackened at all. Um, my first five years as a very young scientist were exciting, but if you look at the most recent five years, there have been discoveries of um, uh, gravitational waves from space, important new technique, and lots of evidence that there are planets orbiting around other stars, mm -hmm. some of which may have life on them. So these are very exciting subjects, yeah. all in the last five years. So it's a great subject, and I like to say that astronomy is really a fundamental science. It involves the most fundamental aspects of the natural world, but also it's the grandest environmental science, because the night sky is the one feature of the environment which all humans throughout history mm. have gazed at and wondered at mm. and interpreted in their own way. So it's the one thing which we all have in common, uh, wondering about the night sky. Mm. Wonderful. In your mm. book, Just Six Numbers, you have wrote about the wonderful properties of the universe that enable life to mm -hmm. exist, this special earth um, that makes <laughs> it hospitable to life. Yes. Mm -hmm. For someone like me who hasn't studied physics in any advanced way, can you explain that science? Yes. Well, of course, we're coming to understand uh, the various processes whereby from some hot, dense beginning, the universe expanded and stars condensed out from the primordial gas and uh, some of them made planets and they also produced complex chemistry, etc. We've come to understand all this, and we realize that uh, it's all a manifestation of the laws of physics, the laws of nature. And it's amusing to uh, speculate about counterfactual universes where the laws were different, where gravity might yeah. have a different strength, um, or where chemistry was simpler, where only hydrogen atoms could exist, etc. And uh, the main point of that book, which you mentioned, was to point out that uh, uh, it happens that the laws of nature um, allow complexity to emerge. Mm. To give you two examples where this wouldn't happen, first, supposing that there was only hydrogen and no other chemical elements, no periodic table, then you couldn't have any complicated structures, and there'd be no nuclear fuel for the stars, etc. And also, suppose gravity was much, much stronger. If it was much stronger, then anything bigger than an insect would get crushed and no evolution would have happened. Mm. So uh, we have to have certain constraints on the strength of the various fundamental forces and the way they behave in order um, to understand how this complexity, which manifests itself most extremely in the biological world, of course, uh, could emerge from simple beginnings mm. by a series of steps, each giving more complexity than the last one. Yeah, I know you've done a lot of writing and thinking around the future of humanity and mm -hmm. our brains and yeah. the development and the place that AI might play mm -hmm. in that and thinking to the future. I'm thinking back 17 years ago, you wrote 
the book Our Final Century. Right, yeah, yes. Um, mm -hmm. Will the human rice race survive the 21st century? Yes, yes. And you said in that that there was a probability of extinction by the end of this century of around 50% mm -hmm. for the human race. Yes. Do you do you still, what's your thinking on that now? Well, I think we have a bumpy on. ride, I think, because uh, the main theme of that book and my uh, new old book called On the Future is that uh, although the Earth's been around for 45 million centuries, mm. four and a half billion years, this is the first of those centuries when one species, namely the human species, has the future to the planet in its hands mm. and could determine uh, whether um, we um, bring this marvellous evolution to an end or whether we can perhaps help to carry it forward to a new phase in the far future. We don't know. But this century is very special. And it's special because um, there are more of us on this planet. We're more empowered by technology. Um, and uh, we are um, able to affect the whole ecology of the planet. and. Also, we are um, developing a society where even a few people could have so much power by bio or cyber technology that they could cause massive disruption. Mm. So the big problems of governance, uh, given that's happening, and also uh, problems of ensuring that we can um, cope with a growing population mm. um, and uh, avoid um, a breakdown of society. So mm. all these uh, challenges happened this century and uh, um, uh, the worst case is of course wiping ourselves out and it's very unlikely but I do think we have a bumpy ride because it's going to be very hard to uh, cope with a world where even a few people can cause massive disruption. Mm. As I like to say the global village will have its village idiots and they will have a global range yeah. and we've got to cope with that so yeah. um, I think uh, um, ethics has not kept up with our knowledge and our power. Mm. Mm -hmm. So where do you think that religion can play a part in humanity's response to these things? Um, well, I think, uh, first, obviously, um, uh, the mystery and wonder of nature is something which I think any scientist uh, appreciates more than the average person. Um, because uh, you know, if you just think of all the chemical reactions that are involved in a, a, a flower growing or of insect flapping its wings. It's so amazing that this happens. And so the wonder and mystery of nature is something which the more you understand about mm. it, uh, the more deeply you wonder at. So that's, that's one thing. But uh, I, I think um, apart from that, uh, I, I think um, if we are um, trying to persuade the public to uh, take action, uh, we have to accept that politicians have difficulties because um, uh, they have an urgent parochial agenda um, and to get them to make a sacrifice here and now for the benefit of people in remote parts of the world 50 years from now is a big ask and they won't do that unless they feel the public's behind them and so uh, if we want to preserve democracies and at the same time take the long-term action which as you know is needed if we are to uh, uh, deal with potential climatic threats, uh, then uh, people have to care. And that's why we should welcome um, the campaigns by young people, especially, which are um, helping to sensitize the public to the importance of these things. Mm -hmm. Because if the um, uh, politicians realize that voters are behind them, they will, they will do something like mm -hmm. this. But uh, um, the, the voters have to uh, care and uh, not discount the future too heavily. I mean, the problem is that in uh, most business decisions, you uh, discount the future at 5% per year, so you don't care what happens after mm. 2050. Uh, whereas most individuals, if they think of it, they realise they ought to care about uh, uh, the, the lives when babies born today um, grow old, and that'll be in the beginning of the 22nd century. Mm. Um, so we need to think far ahead. Um, and uh, uh, people need to care. And um, uh, the great religions um, are... Uh, helpful in that. I mean, I, uh, I mentioned particularly the Catholic Church because I was involved um, in uh, um, some of the input to the papal encyclical, um, which he published in 2015 and which was important in the lead up to the Paris Climate Conference in December of that year. Um, the Pope got a standing ovation at the UN and uh, he's got a billion followers in Latin America, Africa and East Asia. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, um, the, the 
public and the politicians in those countries, they realized that there was some support um, for doing something to uh, remove a risk mm. and pay an insurance premium so that uh, things didn't get too bad in the second half of the century. Um, and so that was where religion helped. Mm. Um, and uh, I think um, uh, the public can help, these demonstrations help, and scientists, if they go public, can help. I think uh, uh, another example um, that I would quote is that um, uh, plastics in the ocean, yeah. which is a separate environmental degradation which we need to worry about, um, that is um, uh, something which wasn't on the agenda until recently, and the um, Blue Planet programs funded yeah. by David Attenborough um, had a big impact, especially the um, uh, albatross returning to its nest and coughing up plastic mm. for its young, uh, which was um, an iconic image, rather like the um, polar bear and the melting ice floor was for the uh, climate campaign. And um, uh, I think because millions of people remember that image, um, that's why one of our less vital politicians, Mr. Michael Gove, was willing to uh, uh, propose legislation to reduce the uh, amount of non-reusable plastic waste. Uh, yeah. and, uh, so it's up uh, to... It, yes, so he felt he could do that and had uh, support and wouldn't lose votes. And, mm. and so I think the, um, the, the scientists or popularizers of science who get through to the big public, they, they have a very important role because um, uh, I know people who've been advisors to government ministers and things like that. And they have a hard time because uh, the ministers do have an urgent agenda and they won't necessarily um, give priority to someone who says that in 50 years this terrible thing will happen if you don't do, do something now. Um, but uh, um, if um, you're a scientist and can get through to a wide public, which ensures that the issue uh, figures in the inbox of politicians, figures in the press, and involves the way people vote, then the politicians will do the right thing. Yeah, so there's mm. a place for everybody who's watching this interview. We all have a part to play absolutely. in telling our politicians that these are issues we're concerned about. Well, well we absolutely, want them to take politicians will uh, take action if they think they won't lose votes thereby. And, uh, and of course, they tend to feel that people uh, focus on the parochial or the short term. Mm. But if they realise that there are these long-term issues which... Um, will affect uh, our children and grandchildren, etc., et and the entire future of, uh, of this planet, um, th then they will take action. Mm. You talked earlier about um, that wonder of, mm -hmm. of the natural world, mm -hmm. and that's one of the things that I aim to do in mm -hmm. saying yes mm -hmm. to life, is mm -hmm. inspiring people, just this, yes, yes. the amazingness <laughs> of mm. life mm. and, and, and of yes. this space that we Utterly, yes, inhabit. Yes. Utterly amazing. Mm. Yeah, what, where do you see wonder? What, um, what gives you a sense of wonder? Um, well, I think um, uh, uh, you're probably expecting me to say the scale of the universe. And that's, that, that, that's amazing in a way. But I think it's the um, complexity of the biological world. Mm. And because uh, uh, one point I often make um, is that um, uh, uh, what makes things hard to understand is their complexity, not their size. Mm. And that an insect is far harder to understand than either an atom or a star. And so uh, the real wonder is the complexity of the natural world, the layer upon layer of complexity mm -hmm. uh, in even the smallest insect. Um, and, uh, and, and, and what's emerged from evolution over nearly four billion years, I think I find that astonishing. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, uh, and we're coming to understand many aspects of this, um, but the more we understand, the more amazing it is. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a mistake to think that, uh, um, you know, that, that knowledge destroys wonder. I think it deepens the wonder. Mm. I mean, uh, uh, I'm sure if, if, if you, you realise that uh, everything an animal does involves the interaction of zillions of cells and, uh, and in each cell lots of chemical reactions happening all the time, it makes it more amazing than it is if you, you don't know anything about the microstructure of animals. So um, I think science adds to the sense of mystery and wonder um, and uh, of course motivates us to try and understand it better. I mean, you mm. understand a lot more now but um, uh, that doesn't diminish the wonder. 
Can I just finish with a final question mm -hmm. around hope? Mm -hmm. And I know we've touched on so many different things in the course of this interview. Do, mm -hmm. you, do you have hope for a positive future for the earth and our place in it? I do. I, I'm anxious because there, yeah. are, there are these new risks which are, um, uh, which are emergent. And although uh, science has allowed us to uh, cope with lots of problems and people are healthier, they live longer than they ever did, etc., um, there are new emergent risks which we, which we have to confront now and which didn't exist in the past, uh, which could cascade globally. I worry that uh, there's a new class of threats which, uh, if they happened, would affect the whole world. Mm. Uh, in the past, you could have something which is catastrophic in a part of the world, um, but the rest went on uh, unaffected, whereas we're so interconnected that uh, something that's a disaster in one part of the world will cascade globally. That's the downside. But the motive for trying to avoid those catastrophes is one which I probably feel more deeply as an astronomer, because the one thing which astronomers perhaps perceive more than most educated people is the huge extent of the future. Uh, I think most um, educated people are now aware that the past is very long, with the outcome of nearly four billion years of evolution uh, on the Earth. But many people who believe that somehow think that we humans are the culmination, the end point of it all. Now, no astronomer could believe that, because astronomers know that the sun is less than halfway through its life, and the universe will go on much longer, maybe forever. Mm. And I like to quote Woody Allen, who said, eternity is very long, especially towards the end. And so uh, we are maybe not even the halfway stage in the emergence of wonderful complexity. Mm. And so uh, if you look at things that way, uh, then um, if something happened here on the Earth which foreclosed all future developments, uh, that would be foreclosing developments far more wonderful than anything we've happened up till now. And so that makes me more motivated uh, to ensure that we do escape the risks that we are confronting in this uh, particularly dangerous century, a century which is dangerous because it's the first time that one species can determine the planet's fate. Mm. Martin, thank you so much. Uh, fascinating a, to yeah. hear okay. from you. Yeah. We, we live in an amazing world mm, and an amazing mm -hmm. universe. Mm -hmm. And to be able to have just this little bit of time to hear from you mm. on it with all of your expertise mm. has yes. been wonderful. So thank you. Well, thank you very much. And if I can make one more point, it's that uh, uh, people who uh, are not experts in science shouldn't be frightened of the science mm. because it's true that uh, the technical details of the mathematics are very complicated. Um, and you need a lot of training before you can understand them. But what's important about science is the big ideas, and they can be conveyed uh, to everyone. Mm. Um, just as you, know, you can appreciate music even if you can't compose it or can't even play it. Yeah. Um, and so in the same way, even people who can't contribute to science and don't understand the details of the technicalities and the instruments on which we depend to make progress, uh, they can understand the... Uh, important ideas that come out of it mm. and it should affect the way they think about the world. Which is a great relief to someone like me. <laughs> so thank you very right. much. Thank you Ruth. Mm -hmm.